All right. Hey, everyone. So I've got a few minutes here today, and I, I want to use it to talk about a single plan to get America's spectrum policies moving again. For years, the United States has led the world in freeing up spectrum for wireless tech. And our lives have improved tremendously because of it. But lately, we've slowed down. In some ways, we've stopped entirely. We've even watched as other countries have moved ahead. And why is that? If you ask most people, they will say things like, well, all the low-hanging fruit has been plucked. There are no more easy spectrum decisions in the United States anymore. There's just so much use. We have to accept tighter times ahead. And this line of thinking, what it's really doing is it's pitting our national priorities against each other. So you've got economic growth being pitted against national security and this idea that it's one or the other. Well, I don't believe uh, I think a lot about something that Tim Berners-Lee said, actually, many, many years ago. He was talking about the internet. Uh, he was talking about all the success it had achieved, all the problems it was facing. Uh, and he said, uh, the future is still so much bigger than the past. And I believe that. I think that's true for wireless as well. I think that our best days can still be ahead of us. If you um, consider that we have a little bit of momentum to build from, then I think the path forward starts to come clear. Late last year, the administration released a national spectrum strategy. It targets two bands to get the United States back on track when it comes to spectrum policy, and that's the lower three gigahertz band and the seven and eight gigahertz band, and we'll talk more about those. Now, these might not be low-hanging fruit in the United States, but I do think that they are worthwhile opportunities, and it's really important that we get these bands right. But before we get to that, I want to talk about what's at stake when we think about United States spectrum policies. And right now, we're sort of just at this beginning stage of realizing the benefits that come from investing in new technologies like 5G. If you look at it, 5G has accomplished in three years what 4G did in five. And that's more than one billion subscribers worldwide. It's available on more than 265 commercial networks. There have been over 2,000 devices launched, 40% of which cost over $200. There are hundreds of fixed wireless access projects and thousands of enterprise 5G projects deployed around the world. It's a lot of really, really good progress. If you look at the United States alone, what you see is that wireless standards in the U.S. have invested $39 billion as at the last year alone in this technology. If you go back to 2018, when this 5G was first launched, that number becomes $160 billion. And that's important because it represents one of the largest technology investments to upgrade our nation's technology base in history. And those investments are, are starting to pay off. Last year, we saw a 42% increase in the wireless speeds available in the United States, and that's because of mid-band spectrum that's come online. We also saw a 40% year-over-year increase in the amount of data traffic that's being carried on American wireless network. That, again, is the largest growth in a single year that the industry has seen. It's a lot of activity. And I want to emphasize something here. All of this growth is thanks to full power license spectrum that feeds America's wireless networks. There's no other spectrum access model that's driving this side of investment or this side of growth, or that's bringing the benefits of new technologies to more Americans. Of course, the killer 5G use case right out is we're all looking for one is, is fixed wireless access or 5G to the home. It's bringing real competition to the broadband marketplace for the first time. It's also helping to close the digital divide. About 20% of 5G growth ads are first timers to the broadband marketplace entirely. That means they didn't have broadband before. So that's what that say when we're talking about spectrum policy. Now, before I was at CTIA, uh, I was at the FCC. And I've told this story before, but if you walked into my office at the FCC, there was only one thing hanging on my wall, and it was a brand. And on that x-axis of the graph was time measured in years, and on the y-axis was the amount of traffic that was going over our wireless networks. And in the middle of that graph was a very recognizable hockey stick, right? I'm sure you're all picturing it right. And if you took the handle of that hockey stick and you projected it out, 
what you saw was that eventually we run out of capacity. We can't keep up with all of that growth. And when we projected out, what we see is that American wireless networks they need access to about 1,500 megahertz of additional license spectrum over the next 10 years in order to keep up with demand. Now, you set me from a capacity angle, but you can also see it from two other angles as well. And the first is what I like to call the keeping up with the Joneses. What's the rest of the world doing? Well, if you look globally, the United States is trailing other countries when it comes to mid-band spectrum availability. So analysis based into this report about a year ago, and they, they looked across the world, and what they found is that our economic peers, our global rivals, had access to about 44% more spectrum than the United States did. What's more, it's we're starting 2024 even further behind on that metric. And that's because back in December, about 164 countries gathered together at the World Radio Communication Conference in Dubai to talk about how they were going to use spectrum. And a lot of those countries left that conference with the potential for another 700 megahertz on top of that that's not available in the United States. So we're behind, but we're also out of bounds. Again, if you zoom in on that critical mid-band range, and this is really important spectrum because it's got those technical characteristics that make it really good for 5G service. It can cover a large area, you get that propagation. It has a lot of capacity, so you get this too. So it's important spectrum. And what you see in that range is that the federal government is the biggest user. And after that, unlicensed and shared spectrum eclipses licensed spectrum by about four to four. Even if you go higher in the spectrum chart in millimeter wing, it's the same. Sir. What this means is that the United States right now is leading the world when it comes to licensed and unlicensed spectrum, but we're trailing the world when it comes to uh, licensed spectrum availability. So why does this matter? It matters because for the first time, we are facing a credible and well-resourced threat to our wireless leadership. And let me take a quick aside here and, and you know, talk about some of the discussions that we were having in the US government when we talked about spectrum policy. What we saw was, or at least what I saw, was this view uh, that in the United States, our national power will come from our military holding on to spectrum assets. When you looked at other countries, if you look at governments like the Chinese government, they were taking a different view. Their view was that national power would come from the success of their commercial technologies and their ability to proliferate them around the world. So you had these two kind of different paths, but what it meant was that they were mobilized. And so far, the United States has yet to make any spectrum available for 5G that comes close in scale or scope to that of the Chinese government. That's a metric I think that we need to keep an eye on. I don't think that we can cede our spectrum leadership or cede our technology leadership and hope to sustain our military advantage. Right. So these, these are things where we have to find those win-win opportunities. So I promised the plan, but what does that look like? Well, it's got three parts. First, I think we need to restore the tried and true spectrum policies that have made the United States the world leader of the past. Second, I think we need to reaffirm experts and science-based policy making when it comes to spectrum. And third, we need to reinvigorate our alliances and our partnerships around the world. I think if we can do these things, we can start to get back on track. So what does that look like? First, to restore the tried and true spectrum policies. No surprises here. We need Congress to restore the FCC's auction authority. Uh, and when it does so, we need it to provide that predictable predictable pipeline of spectrum to support commercial innovation. This is table stakes. But we also need to restore what I talked about earlier. We need to restore that full power licensed spectrum opportunity back into our regulatory tool house because it has been taken out. We saw it taken out in, in the uh, process to study the lower three gigahertz stand where that option wasn't even considered. That often has really created the win-win opportunities that we need in this country right now. With it, we've been able to upgrade military systems. We've been able to grow our economy. We've even been able to fund the public infrastructure projects that this country sorely needs. And an example of that is FirstNet, deploying the very first public safety network uh, in the United States. And so it's an important tool to have in our toolbox that we need to get it back into uh, our, our spectrum policy making discussions. Number two, we need to reaffirm experts and science-based policymaking. This is a simple concept. When you put an incumbent 
who has a vested interest in the outcome, in charge of a spectrum study, credibility suffers. It doesn't matter who the incumbent is, credibility suffers. And so we need to put the experts back in charge of that process. And what does that look like? It looks like NTIA taking charge of spectrum studies in this country again. It's not only good policy, it's, re it's required in President Biden's uh, presidential memorandum. If you read it, what he says is NTIA speaks for the executive branch when it comes to spectrum. That if you're a federal agency and you're going to do a spectrum study, you've got to go to NTIA first. You have to share your modeling, your assumptions, your methodology, and you've got to share the data. I think we've got to give meaning to those words. We now have to carry that through and put NTIA back in charge of the spectrum studies set that uh, are planned over the next two years. And number three is reiterate our alliances that are to our moral. Last week, Accenture put out a paper. And what that paper concluded was that there's about $200 billion in economic benefit that's at risk if the United States can't find a way to work with its allies and work with its partners on how it uses Cytron. If we can't harmonize that use, that's what's at risk. What we know is when we do harmonize our use in that way, not only does it yield economies of scale, it also means less reliance around the world on the technologies of our adversaries. And so that's national security benefit that comes from, from that as well. So I want to pull this all together. What does it look like in terms of uh, a path forward? I mentioned that the national spectrum strategy targets the lower three gigahertz and the seven and eight gigahertz bands. We do need to get those bands right. There's not a lot of safety margin in that national spectrum strategy. It only has those two opportunities in the near term. So I think that the opportunity to do that is in the implementation plan that NTIA will develop uh, for March. So if we look at the lower three gigahertz band first, it's a globally harmonized band. It's been identified by Congress for a commercial opportunity. The DOD already accommodates full power 5G systems in that band in other countries. All of the pieces are there. The United States should now do what the rest of the world has already figured out and prioritize both national security and economic growth in that band. And the way you can do that is by looking at opportunities to segment the band and provide for a full power licensed opportunity in that 3.3 to 3.45 gigahertz range. The second band is out of naked gigahertz band. This one's a little bit different. This is an opportunity now for the United States to actually lead in the development of a new globally harmonized 5G band. This band was targeted by the IDU as a future harmonization target. It means the rest of the world is going to go there to add 5G capacity, launch 6G systems, do a lot of mobile activity. The other advantage of this band is that it lets the US match the planned mobile deployments in the nearby 6 gigahertz band, which isn't available to us. So even though we can't get in 6, it means we can get in the same tuning range because these bands are right next to each other. And what does that mean? It means we benefit from the economies of scale. It means we participate in the same equipment market. It means we realize all the benefits as if we were in six ourselves. So this is now a, a really unique, uniquely important opportunity for the United States. So there's, there's not a lot of opportunity, but there's a lot of progress that can be made if we can take advantage of the bands that are available to us. Uh, and I thought that I thought you know one could start to sue. Thank you.